Well, good morning. Good to meet with you all again, and uh, it's good that you can come and join us here in the Great Smoky Mountains, and that's where we are this week in the Smoky Mountains, and visiting Eileen's brother in Knoxville, and uh, we've been having a good time this week. But I did want to get I did want to get this lesson to you, and so we're going to be starting today in Isaiah 46, and uh, in Isaiah 46, God uh, Isaiah talks about the idolatry and God is speaking to his people through Isaiah here about idolatry and the idolatry that they've been observing has been a, a terrible thing to behold and so let's go ahead and start with Isaiah 46 starting at uh, verse 1 it says Bel bows down Nebo stoops low this is referring to uh, a, a celebration that they had in Babylon and that celebration was called Akitu. And they, during that celebration, they would transport their gods all over the city and show, uh, show them off to different people. And these are gods that they had built. Uh, these were the gods uh, Nebo and uh, Marduk, uh, or Bel. And these were the main Babylonian gods. And they were built by the people, and they uh, were carried around through the city on carts and on people's shoulders and on the backs of um, animals and so forth. And they were very heavy. And so it shows here that uh, it, God's emphasizing here that Nebo and, and Bel have no power because they have to be transported around. As a matter of fact, they are such a burden for their people that the burden is, is oppressive for them. Uh, as we see here, it says their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. And so really what Isaiah is saying here is that uh, these gods, uh, Nebo and Bel, have no power. They were created by man. Uh, the gods themselves were built by man, by, by goldsmiths, goldsmiths and silversmiths. And so since the people had to create them themselves, they really didn't amount to much of a god at all. And, so, and they weren't uh, a god that could deliver. They were a god that needed to be delivered. It had to be carried through the streets. They had to be carried around. And they were a very heavy burden. In order for them to go around to places where the people wanted them, they had to pick them up and carry them. And so God's saying here, these gods are a burden. I'm not a burden. I'm here to help you with your loads and help you carry things along, carry through your life. And you don't have to carry me around. I'm here for you at all times. Uh, in the next slide here, it says, listen to me, you descendants of Jacob. Now, this is a, a something that we're, we're, Isaiah is referring here to the... Uh, the united kingdom again. Uh, at that time, the Judah and Israel were divided, and he's coming, he's talking about the future. And in the future, he's saying, This will be the descendants of Jacob. All of Israel will be reunited. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried you since you were born. So he's saying, look at here, you don't have to carry me around. I carry you. I've carried you since I delivered you from Egypt. You're the remnant of the people of Israel. You are the ones who are faithful to me. He says, I, you whom I have upheld since your birth, since you were delivered from, uh, from Egypt, and have carried since, carried since, you, since you were born. And so he's saying, I'm the one that carries. I'm the one that delivers. You don't have to move me. I move to where I want to go. I move to where I'm supposed to go. I have this all planned out. But I have done this since you were, uh, since you were very little. It says, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you. And I will rescue you. And so he's saying, you don't have to rescue the, me because as you would have to do Bel and Marduk, uh, Bel and Nebo, uh, 
they have to be carried around. But I'm here for you. I have always been here. There's a point at which you created these gods yourself. And so they, they have a finite beginning. You made them. You made them at some point in time, and they have no power. And so you now uh, can rely on me because I am the one. I have al already told you that I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to carry you, uh, even to your old age and gray hairs. Uh, I am he who will sustain you. And so I love this picture that's in this slide here. Um, it's a, a kind of a feeble older person there. And many times when we're ministering in hospice, I can just about see Jesus with his arms around people in these beds as, as they await their time to, to transition over to him. And I can see that God cares and God is there for them. And sometimes this is the picture of who's laying in the bed there. But to picture God as the one who's there to rescue, the one who carry you, that's the picture of a God that is truly reliable, a God that has power, a God that has power over us, has power over everything. There are no gods whatsoever to compare with him. It says, with whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? There's no one like me. There is no one can even comes close I don't know why you look to some other little tiny God. This other God is so, the other gods that you've created are so little and so insignificant that you don't have any, they don't have any power at all because you created them. You can't, nobody's as big as I am. I'm the biggest, I'm the biggest there is. I was always there from the beginning. I created the world. I created you. I created everything there is, and I will always be here. You don't have to worry about me going away. I'll be here. I have my plan. Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it, make it into a god, and they bow down and worship it. And God's saying, isn't it kind of ludicrous? You take your valuables. You give them over to somebody else. You have them create a god for you. And it, apparently it's a God that you want, uh, a, a God with the characteristics that you'd like for that God to have. And, and you give them the gold, you give them the silver, they weigh it out, the goldsmiths form it into a God, and then you bow down and worship it. Bow down and worship something that you have actually paid for, that you have created, that you had somebody else put together. I've always been here for you. You didn't have to create me. I've been here since the beginning of creation. So I've loved you so much that I've cared for you. You are my chosen people. And so uh, since you have moved away from me and moved to idols, you're going to have a problem because I am going to allow things to happen that will correct this problem for me. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up on its place and there it stands. From that spot, it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. And so he says, these gods you've created are big, heavy things. They have, in order for them to be where you want them to be, you have to carry them. You have to rely on, they have to, the God has to rely on you to move it around. It can't even move itself. It can't do anything. Uh, once you put it somewhere, it can't move from there. It can't do anything for you while it's sitting there. Even though you cry out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save you from your troubles. And so he's saying these gods that you're worshiping, the things that are getting you into the most trouble are the things that, that you have created, that you have put in your life. And those are things that we need to be thinking about today. This is applicable to today, to today as well. We have created things in our lives that are very distracting to us, that call us away, call, away from our, call us away from our concentration on the one true God, on the God of the universe. And he loves us and he wants us to be around him. He wants us to worship him. He wants us to talk to him. He wants to talk to us. And so he is there capable of doing that. He's not like one of these gods that's been put together by 
goldsmiths and silversmiths, and it cannot do anything. You carry it to where you want it to be, you put it down, and it stays there. It can't go anywhere on its own. If you want it someplace else, you have to pick it up and move it. And so uh, those gods cannot be of any help to you. Remember this, keep it in mind, take it to heart, you rebels. And he's re referring to them as rebels because they are mo moving toward these other gods. You see, they, they have not put God in the forefront. Uh, God needs to be everything, and not just in the forefront. He has to be everything. There can be no other, uh, other gods in our life. First commandment is that you will have no other gods before me. And so when we try to create things, when things appear in our lives that take precedent over the worship of our God, then that becomes our idol. Today's idols take different forms. We don't make them out of silver and gold, but uh, it may involve uh, sports. It may involve uh, our, our work. It may involve uh, families. It may involve any number of things that are going to distract us from the worship of God. And when people say, well, I just don't have time to pray. I don't have time to get to church. Well, that's telling me that there's something in your life that is more valuable to you than God. There's nothing more valuable than God, and we have to understand that. We have to focus all of our attention on our God. These people had created these gods as plan B, just in case our God couldn't deliver us. They still had God in there mixed in with it, but they came up with these other gods just in case God wasn't quite powerful enough. And I think we have the, the hindsight to see that God is powerful enough to deliver us from anything, to take care of us through every situation. And so God cannot be plan B. He has to be the only plan. He has his plan. He's going to work his plan through everything. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. These are the things from long time, a long time ago. Think back. I told you that I am. Uh, I told you that I created you. I told you that I brought you out of Israel. I delivered you out of captivity, and I gave you the promised land. I gave you the land that you, now, you want to claim now as your own, but which will be taken from you and you'll be carried off to another land. And so this upcoming captivity, the upcoming exile is going to be of your own doing because you refuse to use me as your only source of power, as your only, your only plan. You cannot go back on something else. Use some, some other God just in case our God isn't quite enough. But he says, I am. I am God and there is no other like me. I am God, there is none like me, and so rely on me. I'm here for you. I'm not gonna make this difficult for you. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. And you'll see on the slide, we have the, the Greek letters alpha and omega. That stands for the beginning and the end. That's the beginning and the end of the, uh, of the Greek alphabet. And so he says, I make known the end from the beginning. He's always been there. God came up with everything. God is running everything. God will be there through everything. He was there from before time. He's there now. He will be there on into eternity. And so it's not a God that has to be carried around, that, that cannot, be, ca cannot control anything. My purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. God has planned all this out. He has a place for each of us. He has a position for each of us. He has a job for each of us. And as you can see here through the, the, uh, the pottery process there, uh, we have a, a clay, uh, a glob of clay that hasn't been farmed into anything yet. We have uh, a rather common vessel, and then down in the bottom right there is a, a very fancy vessel. And so we can't look to 
decide to be like anybody else because God has created us to be the individuals that we are. He has given us characteristics. He's given us talents. He's given us abilities. And he's given us the passion to do things in his name. All that we do has to be done in God's name. And because he gives us all the power to do everything we can. And he says, I, I say that my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. He has decided this. He's decided this is what he's going to do. And now he announces that coming from the east, uh, they're, they're going to be in, in uh, captivity in Babylon. But after they are in captivity, he will send someone from the east. From the east, I will summon a bird of prey from a far off land a man will fulfill my purpose and he's he's now predicting that cyrus is going to come in he's going to defeat the leaders of babylon that put them into captivity nebuchadnezzar uh, and so forth and and cyrus is going to come in and conquer babylon and if you'll see this picture here it's a picture of a bird that's where we get this uh, phrase here he talks about from the east i summon a bird of prey that is uh, Cyrus's battle standard there, his flag with the, with the bird on it there, the, the bird of prey. So God is saying, I'm going to call in someone. This is not going to be a wonderful person. This is going to be an evil person. But I will use him for my purposes. I will use him to deliver you. And so he's saying, I have the power even to use these evil people to, to take care of you, to provide for you, to put you where you belong. And he says, once you go into captivity, I'm going to send a bird of prey, Cyrus, uh, to come in and deliver you. He will fulfill my purpose. My purpose is to teach you a lesson by allowing you to go into captivity, into the exile, and you will have to live around, uh, around Babylon. But you will come back. And uh, this person from the east is going to deliver you. He's going to fulfill his purpose by someone else coming in and defeating the people who have placed you in exile. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. There's no doubting what God's going to accomplish. God's going to do these things through his own power, on his own schedule, and we probably won't see that the things that he has planned for us, we won't recognize them uh, because we, we tend to say to ourselves, well, this God is, is he's apparently not paying attention. He's not doing what he's not caring for us. He's not taking care of. He's not doing the things that we think he should do. But God is doing the things that he thinks he should do. And so that's what we have to keep in mind. God will do the best for us and he will help us to learn through our uh, some of the trials and tribulations that come upon us. And in this case, it's going to be going into exile and having to leave Jerusalem. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted, you who are far from my righteousness. He's talking about the Israelites who are worshiping the idols. There's still a remnant of the Israelites who are not worshiping the other idols. Uh, and to stay true to God and stay obedient to God and observe his laws. But he's saying there are a lot of you who are stubborn, stubborn hearted, you who are far from my righteousness. And he's talking to these that are going to go into exile and he's telling us the reason this is going to happen. He says, because you're stubborn, because you won't stay with me, because you turn away to other gods, you're going to have a problem here coming up in this exile. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away. And my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. And so he's coming to bring the people back, bring them back to Jerusalem. He's saying it's not going to be long. My righteousness is near. It's not far away. Things are going to get better. And so don't lose heart. Uh, it says, my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. 
He's talking about this center here, the center of their life as Israelites, and that is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of the new uh, promised land that he's given them, which is the, the new Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden is a, is a wonderful place, and it's going to be the, the great place. And they will once again be able to commune with God on a regular basis, have a physical place to be, have a communion with God as he stays with them, as he comes to them in Jerusalem. That's the place he has designated that he will be. And so he says, uh, you will, I will be there for you, and I will grant salvation to, to Zion. That's Zion is the place of Jerusalem. And then we have that, uh, that quotation from Rick Warren. It says, through salvation, our past has been forgiven. Our present given meaning and our future secured. And that's God from the past, through the present, through the future. He is there. And so God has been there for us. God doesn't want any other distractions. He doesn't want us moving toward anything else. He doesn't want us uh, worshiping anything else. And so now we need to look to him and deliver, ha have him deliver us from what we have moved away from. Man has always tended to uh, move away from God, even though we see his, his presence around us. We see his natural revelation in, uh, in, in nature all around us, uh, the beautiful things we have around us, this, uh, this, this valley we have here that I'm showing you in Tennessee. Uh, this is the, a beautiful place. And you can't look at these kinds of things and not know that God isn't there. But our problem is when we start to, uh, when we start to become prosperous, when, when things go pretty good for us, we tend to move away from God. And that's when we should be moving closer to Him, thanking Him for all that He has given us. He has given us all that we have. He's given us life. He's given us our, our place to be. He's given us a future. He's given us uh, eternity into which we will move with him. And when we turn our lives over to him, uh, when, we, when we surrender to him, which is what we call it when we're saved, when we give our life to Jesus, we surrender to him. And when you surrender to someone, you are giving up control. And so we need to give our control to God. He is our Lord. He's the one who will control us. And we need for him to do that because we're not very good at doing this on our own. We're not very good at controlling things on our own. We tend to mess up our lives when we move away from God, when we don't think about the things that he wants us to be thinking about. We don't focus on the things that he wants us to focus on. He is the one who will be there for us. And when, when we give our lives to Jesus, which is now our, our New Testament uh, covenant, that the blood of Jesus... Uh, dying on the cross is the only way to forgive our sin. Our sin has to be forgiven before we can spend eternity with him. And through this new covenant of Jesus coming to be the center of our life, to be everything we want, the, everything that we need, that is when our lives will improve. And we will see God moving in our lives in wondrous ways. So I thank you for being with me today. I hope you've been, had a good time with this. Uh, hope we're, we're having a great time here in Tennessee and let let's move on and we'll be finishing up the rest of Isaiah when we get back into town again later so let's close this with a word of prayer the gracious Heavenly Father we thank you so much we pray that you would be with us every moment we know that you're there but we pray that you would help keep our focus on you and that our focus would would be the things of you the, the service to you, the service for you. Help us to reach out and touch other people. Help us to tell them about the wonderful, uh, wonderful gift that you have for us in, in your son Jesus and the gift of salvation that you bring to us freely. All we have to do is turn ourselves over to you and believe that Jesus is your son. Be with us now. Guide us and protect us. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy from this this pestilence, this disease that's going around right now, and help us stay strong through this election that you, you would be glorified in everything that happens. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.